much for joining for today's session. Uh, we are very excited to have with us Andrew Murphy, who is one of the visionaries and co-founders of Zena Lodge uh, in Ghana, um, who will be speaking about uh, the very interesting and impactful model that they've built there. Uh, so without any delay, I'm going to hand it over to my co-founder at Impact Hub New York Metropolitan Area, Archana Shaw, to dis uh, direct the discussion. Thanks so much. Thanks, JP, and welcome, Andy, and all the attendees. Really appreciate you all coming uh, today. And we're just going to kick it off uh, with a quick question uh, straight to Andy here. If you could, for our attendees, just set the scene, uh, those who may not know Ghana, where is Mole, and really what inspired this project uh, that is now Zaina Lodge? Um, let's be honest, we all are aching to travel also. So maybe just paint us a picture. Take us to Ghana, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Ghana, it's located in West Africa, uh, on the west side, uh, surrounded by French-speaking countries like uh, Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, things like that. Uh, we're in Moli National Park, which is the largest national park in Ghana and northern Ghana. Um, to give you a frame of reference for the U.S., Moli is slightly larger than Grand Canyon National Park and slightly smaller than Everglades. So only Yellowstone in the U.S. is bigger than Moli. Uh, and we are in the southern part of the park. I'm going to literally take you to Zena for a second while we're talking now so that you can actually just see a bit. I won't leave this on the whole time, but just wanted to, as I'm talking, flip through. Um, I first went to, to Ghana in 1998 as a Peace Corps volunteer and was working with my co-founder on community-based ecotourism. I actually had probably the world's best project assignment as a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, I had been a change management consultant for Accenture in DC and decided early in life that consulting wasn't for me, which is ironic because that's what I do now for myself. And um, I ended up meeting this guy, John Mason, who's now my co-founder in Zena. This is just some shots of the lodge. And he basically says, hey, you're a consultant. We're sending you to Northern Ghana. Here's your job description. This is literally how the conversation went. Um, yeah, there's some elephants coming out of Burkina Faso and raiding people's farms. So maybe you can help out with that. Um, we, there's a women's farming association. So we want you to work with them to potentially help them make more money. And, uh, and we think there's potential for ecotourism. So go and explore. And I literally had a budget to build a wooden canoe to, um, to start Zana. And so most of my, my early time in Ghana from, from 98 all the way to 2004, was working on community-based ecotourism. I stayed after Peace Corps and worked with John on a USAID-funded project, and we worked with communities across northern Ghana to help them develop their tourism potential. And part of that came from John had done his master's research on the impact of creating Mali National Park on local communities. And one of the interesting findings was, in a way, by creating the park, you created the poachers because you removed the communities and people from their lands and there was a disconnect over generations. So John started working with communities and this is, I'm just gonna pause for a second because I love seeing um, elephants at the lodge. So that's one of my favorite aspects of Zane as you can see elephants, this is a guy who drinks from the swimming pool. Here he is again. Um, so we worked for years with these community-based tourism enterprises and I can show you later on um, some of those places. But what we found is that if you really wanted tourism, and this gets to, I mean, Zana came out of this project. If you really want tourism to be an engine for growth in communities and a, and a funding driver for conservation as well, you need to figure out a way to, to promote and generate high-end tourism. And that usually tends to mean um, higher-end accommodation. And, and all of Northern Ghana at that time was built for backpackers, essentially, uh, lower-end tourism. It was helping some people, helping some jobs, but we weren't getting the right volume of income into these communities to really make a difference. This is my terrible haircut back in the day. This is me on that canoe that I mentioned earlier. And then I'm just gonna end with this conversation with um, just a few of the communities we work with. One was a place called Sirugu um, that had traditions of uh, local pottery. This is a, a very traditional community we worked with in Northern Ghana and others. So Arshna, just to, to round up that question, I'm gonna stop sharing so I don't distract people is um, we learned in those days that we, we had to take it to the next step, but we couldn't convince anyone to invest in Northern Ghana. They're, the tour operators basically said, eh, sounds cool, if you do it, we'll come, you know, like Field of Dreams. But, um, you know, I, went, I, I left Ghana, went to business school to test whether I was still committed to Ghana. Found that I was, I kept going back to this issue of how do you solve this high-end accommodation problem I ended up writing the business plan for Zana as a final paper in emerging markets real estate class in business school. Uh, we were naive because we thought we could raise the money in about six months. 
turned out it's six and a half years. Um, and, and then here we are. We finally finally did raise the money in 2013, and, and then Zana was born. So that's kind of a, a long intro, but it kind of gives you the backstory of what we learned. But everything that led to Zana was learned in those early years in Ghana. Um, it sounds like uh, a lot of that that research or those local experiences really informed what Zena looks like today. Can you share um, really the values and mission uh, on which Zena was created and conceived? Kind of this whole concept of locally rooted uh, materials, design, sustainability. And as you talk about investors, what, how, how did you convince them that this was a good idea? It seems like you were first to market. Um, how did you how did you hang on to the fact that th this was important to keep the values and mission uh, that you talk about, if you don't mind? Yeah, sure. no, there's, there's a lot there's a lot packed into that question. So I'll start with kind of our values. You know, and I would probably describe it as community conservation and collaboration, um, and all of that was driven by the community based tourism work that we had done for years. And also, I'm in in many ways very much also an advocate for Northern Ghana. So for those of you who are not familiar with Ghana, um, Ghana is about the size of the US state of Oregon flipped on its side. Um, and then you have coastal rainforest in the south and savannah in the north. And so, uh, and correspondingly, quite a bit of poverty in the north. Um, and so a lot of the resources that you know about Ghana, gold, cocoa, timber come from the south. The north was mainly a um, source of labor during the colonial times under the British. Um, a lot of the slave raiding that took place in West Africa took place across that belt where northern Ghana is as well and so we were always very much focused on northern ghana so and and if you look at even today all the hotel buildings and tourism infrastructure in ghana were always on the coast and in the south so we were the first high-end hotel in all of northern ghana ever built there's now others that have followed um so we knew but we also knew so my dream would have been to actually start a lodge in one of these community-based destinations that we work with for example about two and a half hours down the road from us is a hippo sanctuary called the Wachow Hippo Sanctuary that we helped to found in the late 90s. It's actually now a partner of the Calgary Zoo. I would love to have done the first Zan and there or one of the other sanctuaries we work with. The challenge is you gotta go where the market is. So we knew we had to start in Moli National Park because it was the largest tourism attraction in Northern Ghana. Um, Ghana is for whatever reason, Ethiopia was one, it's shifting now, one of the few countries on the entire continent of Africa that didn't have accommodation in its national parks. There's actually still today only one other one. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a motel run by the government that's been there since 1950. So that's technically our, our competition in the park. So we knew we had to start there, but the dream was, could you eventually get to these communities? So, because what we would have done in our original model was actually had communities as an owner of the lodge as well. Um, the way the laws work in Ghana, you cannot have a communities owning land in a national park. It just doesn't work. So we work rather quite closely with the communities around us. And there's, there's, there's two. One is um, a community called Larabanga, which is right outside the park. It has the oldest mosque in West Africa. Um, and so we actually designed Zena in the style of the way houses used to be decorated in, in Larabanga and brought the women from Larabanga. So those pictures of the lodge that I was showing were done by them. Uh, there's another community called Magnori where uh, we take our guests outside the park to do a canoe safari, do a village tour. And that the community members of Magnori did all of the grass roofing of Zena. Um, we get all of our honey and shea butter and local products from there. So the idea was that community activism, sustainability wasn't something you do as an extra, as an add-on. It was core to our DNA. It's just who we are. And so to, to your question on investors, um, we ended up being fortunate enough, although it did take a while to find these people, six and a half years, we, we landed the last guy two months after I quit my job at WWF, which was an interesting time. Um, everyone that's invested in Xana is, is a long-term investor. So we actually had it enshrined in our shareholders agreement that there would be no dividends for the first four or five years um, because we were all focused on making Zena a success. The other thing that I think was important is that uh, everybody either knew Ghana or they knew Africa. So this concept of country risk, of continent risk. And so, you know, that'll flip back to this, the opportunity. I mean, I am the benefactor of people's fear essentially. So you have American investors afraid to come to the African continent. In the same way, you have Southern Ghanaian investors afraid to invest in Northern Ghana. In fact, you know, anecdotally, I think about 75% of Ghanaians have never been to Northern Ghana. Um, I remember our chef, we had a, a great Ghanaian chef named Chef Jove. Um, we had started with a, a really great Indian chef, and when he moved on, we had been looking for an expat. We brought in Chef Jove, and 
all he knew was the stories his grandparents had told him about the North. And so I took him to the city Tamale, which is the regional capital where our guests fly into. And it was a thriving, busy, it's the third biggest city in the entire country. Um, and he's like, wow, this is not the North that my parents told me about when I was growing up because, you know, it's, it's, they, they believe that they're all either like cannibals or there's war or, or conflict. And, and um, it's, it's absolutely my favorite part of the country. So, I mean, that's another long way to say it was a part of everything we do. Absolutely. So it sounds like it wasn't just about um, having to convince investors, but actually having to convince the local population that this was actually a good idea and that this was a place that you had to, you should think about visiting. Um, and engaging the local community was an integral part of, of keeping that, uh, the authenticity of the experience, it sounds like. Yeah, um, it is. And, and you know, no, actually, I just want to add a quick piece there, just because the initial business model, I called it the SARS-proof business model. So the idea was around the time of SARS, which is ironic given what we're doing with COVID right now, is if something shuts down international travel, like Ebola or something else, can you build a basic business that, that thrives on local business and regional business? And so that was the initial idea was we wanted to build our base first from, from Ghanaians and others who are already in Ghana and then spread out. Now, we didn't anticipate the health crisis that shuts down both international and domestic travel. I don't think anyone can, aside from a grocery store, handle that one. But yeah, so yeah, so, but it was yeah. convincing Ghanaians to come up north was a big part of our initial drive. That's, that's impressive because sometimes when you think about travel, you forget the domestic uh, market or you don't think about them as, as a priority initially. And the fact that Southerners were not going north is, is, is pretty, pretty amazing uh, to think about that within their own country, um, there was that delineation almost. One yeah. thing, um, and one thing I want to touch a base on, and, and one of our uh, attendees has also asked this question. So in the context, the lodge is now several years old. And if you could share some of the challenges of maintaining the vision and the mission, uh, especially through times like COVID, obviously COVID has been a big knockback, but also along the way, um, you know, it's, a startup is, is hard in and of itself. How, are you, how have you been able to, at Zena, make sure that the vision and the mission is constantly aligned and as important as the financials? And then also, give, if you give us some context for COVID, uh, that would be helpful uh, for okay. the audience too. Sure, I'll end, I'll end with, the, with the COVID and the current context. I, 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 had, I always tell people I had multiple opportunities to test my commitment to the vision. And um, I think that there's probably nothing more humbling than actually having to implement your own business plan. Um, because what happens is all of the assumptions you made that seem great on paper when they come into real life and you realize where the mistakes are, you own them. Uh, and then you bring those into a board of directors and have to answer those issues and challenges. You know, we, and I'll just give you a couple quick examples. We, um, we, were, we weren't quite on target with what the construction costs were going to be. Um, I had used like the wrong ratio for furniture, fixtures, and equipment. And so those are things you had to, 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 to write while you're, um, while you're flying the ship, essentially. But I think the key thing is to, to engage your leadership directly and have honest conversations and you work through it. Now, you know, did it cost me some equity in the business? Yes. You know, but that's part of the entrepreneurship game, you know, is, and, and you ask yourself, well, how, how, I have so many times where I could say, well, how important is Xana succeeding and, and, and surviving to me dealing with this issue? And, and the, the North Star was always, you know, our plan was always, I didn't leave the U.S. And, and, you know, come out of having done an MBA and have a great job in the U.S. to go run a 25-room lodge. I think that's an amazing thing, and I'm happy with Xana, but the idea was always multiple properties across Ghana and West Africa. And, and we realized at one point that if you don't get the first one to succeed, two, three, and four will never happen. And so you start to... You Take, you, you humble yourself, you take a seat back, and you do what it takes. Um, it wasn't that easy. Um, and, you know, I used to tell people I was on the battlefield of start, startup, startup Africa. On one side, I was on social media, you know, championing the first Safari Lodge in West Africa. On the other side, you're dealing with all kinds of crazy things. So even, and the challenge was we created the industry, so there were no standards to judge us. So I, I'll give you an example. We are, even though we are likened to five-star properties in East and South Africa. We are rated in Ghana as a two-star hotel. And the reason we're rated like that is because Ghana has city hotel standards. So if I want to be a three-star, I need a shoe shine machine. Never going to happen. If I want to be a four-star, I need a tennis court. Also never going to happen. <laughs> to be a five-star, you need a, a, a revolving door. Like you see, uh, um, JP might know uh, the moving pick. Um, we don't have doors because it's an open-air facility. So um, 
But because our entire investors and our leadership team were committed to what we were trying to do, um, it was never really an issue. It wasn't really a big challenge for us. I think what's interesting now was the transition we went through when I stopped running the lodge in 2018 and bringing in a professional manager and then to where we are now. I left the lodge in 2018. I've been doing my own independent consulting work. So it was, it was an interesting thing to let your baby go as well um, and watch that process. And, and, and so that's been an interesting learning piece. Um, but where we've been fortunate is that the, the manager who was in place before it at least left us with some pretty decent cash reserves. I mean, we, the business never took off uh, in terms of revenue as, as fast as we thought it would. I mean, we were, we were essentially at a place where we were uh, not fully profitable, but covering depreciation is cash flow positive. So that's actually, I mean, we're happy with where we are, but we had enough cash reserves that we, we've survived the shutdown. Um, we paid our staff for two months um, and we are riding it out. We could ride out to the end of the year if we had to, that would leave us minimal money to kind of relaunch, but we're, we're kind of hoping we can get an August or September opening uh, and we'll bring all of our staff back. Uh, right now, most of them are on, on furlough, uh, but, but Ghana, Ghana, acted quickly. So Ghana's entire international borders are closed. No flights can get in. And the park that we're in is actually closed. It closed a week after we did. We, we closed middle of March. So we were just on a call this morning. We're kind of hoping and we're getting bookings for August, but um, we really just have to watch how the COVID union, you, you saw the delayed ramp up in South America. So we'll see what happens. Absolutely. Yeah. This thing is, is hard to, hard to predict. I want to, I want to ask one last question and then I do want to go to audience Q and A because we have a very active audience today which is great. Um, we, given, given we're based in the US and our, our, our audience here is our social innovators or innovators um, that care about impact in the many facets that you've talked about, what advice or insights do you have if they wanted to partner with an organization like Zena or were really interested in getting involved in this, um, in this kind of sustainable tourism or community-based tourism? What would be like your top three pieces of advice, if you will? You know, I think that, you know, the, so one thing, uh, you know, part of why we were able to do what we've done is, and frankly, my business partner, John Mason. So John was born in Northern Nigeria. I sometimes describe him as a Nigerian in a white man's body. So he's lived his entire life in West Africa. He helped the government facilitate the process for looking at private concessions. So we're the first private concession ever in a park in Ghana. Uh, but we were also quite clear that we wanted to always go through an official bidding process. So it had to be out in the open and transparent and in a competitive bid. So, so that, so Ghana, to, to exactly replicate what we, we've done is a challenge. But I think that one of the most important things is to go visit places, right? You know, and, and get a sense of where, what part of the world would you like to operate in or be active in? And the only way you can do that, obviously, post COVID is travel. Um, also think about what you're passionate about. You know, I, I became an accidental conservationist. I mean, I went over as a Peace Corps volunteer, you know, like I said, in 1998, I was completely ignorant about Ghana and West Africa. And it was through that elephant project that I, I was always an outdoor person, but really developed this love for conservation and working with, with, with people in, in Northern Ghana. So I think, you know, find your passion, find the area you want to work in. And then, um, reach out to organizations that seem interesting. Cause you know, my, my general rule of thumb is if you don't ask, the answer is no, right? So you have nothing to lose, reach out. Um, and I've done, I have, you know, I, I was telling, telling you a story before we started, but I think it's worth sharing is um, I have spent a lot of time working for the World Wildlife Fund. I built their entire uh, graduate intern program working on sustainable commodities. And I ended up hiring one of those people to do an internship with me when she was doing her MBA at American University in DC, and she built our social media program. Uh, and so you never know when an organization that you might think is set is gonna need some assistance and you might have the skill set. So reach out there. And the other thing is just, if you look at Ghana, it's been amazing to me, you know, I know that JP set up Impact Hub in Accra, is to watch the entrepreneurial ecosystem just blossom in Ghana. I mean, it's, it's, it's changing so rapidly, mostly in Accra, but it, it's hitting there. Even just in the tourism space, the complexity and a variety of restaurants that have opened up in Ghana in the last 10 years. The, we're no longer the only high-end hotel in Northern Ghana, so we've, we've helped people see that it's possible. So, you know, passion, find a location, and, and just ask. That's probably the best. And persevere. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Do not, I mean, yeah, there's one of my favorite diagrams is this um, frog being swallowed by a stork, but the frog's arms are outside the stork, and it's strangling the stork, and it says, never give up. So that's kind of was basically my mantra through all of Zena. Um, whenever you think you're done, take one step forward and just yeah, don't give up. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Andy. I am going to stop being selfish and start asking questions from the audience because we yeah. have many. 
Um, I'll take it from the bottom. Uh, one, one of our uh, attendees is asking, how are you measuring uh, the change or the impact within the community um, given this is community-based, like what are what are the metrics or the um, indications that this is actually making a difference in the community? You know, it's funny. Just uh, I'm gonna you know, give you the answer, but I'm gonna set a preface with. I mean, one of the things that I regretted was not taking more of an academic approach to pre-Zana, post-Zana, both on the community based and also on the environmental front. Um, on the environmental front, we put in two water holes that are natural attractors to different types of antelope, and so we've actually had a positive environmental impact because the number of animals that are now thriving in that area, but we didn't do a pre and post study. And the same with the community, I think it's mostly looking at anecdotal evidence. So for example, tracking the percentage of, we had a requirement by the government of hiring local staff, but we were gonna do that anyway. So the percentage of staff who came from the communities around us, for example, our, our head ranger, Emmanuel Danqua, his father was a wildlife ranger in the park and he grew up in the park. Uh, the other is, is looking at how much business we actually give um, the outside tourism enterprises, both La Bonga and, and the community tours. And we can track that quite easily. We know how many guests we've sent them that are additional guests that wouldn't have come before. We also track the um, amount of things we're, we're buying from those communities. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, everything from the honey we sell in the gift shop and others. Um, but I think what's interesting to me is, so, and this is a purely anecdotal, but I think it's, it's a story worth sharing, is one of the biggest challenges in Ghana is that Ghana is known as kind of a super hospitable country, but for some reason it's never translated to customer service. Like people are really friendly when they welcome you to their home, but not always um, businesses that always had challenge getting their, their employees to exude customer service. And we actually never had that problem at Xana. And I used to tell people, you know, I would love to pretend that I created a magical training system, but I think what it was is there was such a huge level of pride because we had about 70% of our staff were just from the area around the park. And the fact that Xana was there, that they treated it like it was their own. You know, and then and then what we then did is we created this family piece. The idea for us is when people come to Zana, by the time you leave, we won't want you to feel like you're leaving old friends behind. And that means, you know, we don't have a reservations counter. You sit on a couch. We talk to you like we're in our living room. And, and that that went from, from me all the way down to all the staff. So, I, you know, the, it's more anecdotal evidence that we're looking at on those communities. Um, my hope and plan is that once we get to a point where we're actually real profitable, not just cash flow positive, is we have experience setting up development funds with other communities and the work that we had done, uh, where then the communities themselves can start to use some of those funds to then pursue their own projects, be it borehole wells or schools or education. Um, long term, I mean, for me, it's gonna be to be in a sanctuary and actually give a, build a new lodge and actually have those community members be owners as well. So that's a whole different prospect. Wow, so a lot of opportunity, but a lot of work done so far. That's, yeah. that's wonderful to hear. Um, we have one other question that, that I think I think we could we would love to um, uh, we would love to engage a little bit with is um, you talked about two major um, communities living around there how how have they um, how has the community reacted to sort of this um, high end lodge coming in like how cooperative have the local chiefs been how have you how have, how is that how is that buy in been happening. It's, it's, I would describe these two communities, it's almost like a tale of two communities because they're night and day apart from each other. I'd say, but on the whole, for both communities, again, it, it's the same answer to what I just spoke about our staff. The fact that somebody's actually investing in their area because they, they know that by Zana being there, more people are coming to the park, which means more people are coming to them. So on the whole, it's been very, very positive. And we, we made sure, um, again, because of our roots in community-based tourism, so, uh, you know, we actually brought the imam from outside the park. So Ghana is probably a, both an Islamic and a Christian country, more Christian in the south, but the area where we are is heavily Islamic. So we brought the imam from outside the park in to bless the lands in 2012 before we started. He had never been inside the park before. So even that was just like a sign to the community that, hey, these guys are serious. Uh, we later brought, once we opened, the chief of all the Gonjas, so the, the Gonjas are the tribe that own all the land around us. We brought him in to inspect the entire property and he kind of gave us his blessing. Um, so, so that was, they love that. Now, what's interesting is Larabanga is a community that's been getting tourists for four decades. And what I found is that communities, there's another one, uh, a crocodile sanctuary on the border of Northern Ghana that's right on the border of, of Burkina that's also being, and, and you see a different tone and action. A lot of the traditional features of Northern Ghana is kind of stripped away because there's been so much exposure to Western tourists. So 
uh, we had initial challenge. We've actually had to ban Larabanga a couple times because you, what you do is it's like a, it's a tour guide competition. So you have one official tour guide come in and 20 guys are trying to do the tour because they're hoping to get tips. Um, so there's always been a constant back and forth with them. But at one point, the entire youth squad of Larabanga came to see me because they had thought that once we opened Zana, we were going to hire literally all of them. And there were more youth tour guides in Larabanga than we had actually staff at Zana. Uh, but again, you know, you engage directly. So one of the things we did is we, um, and, and the, but before we came in, just to set the context, the park itself had had challenges with Larabanga. So we actually came in as an intermediator because we had a better community approach. So I convinced the park management to bring all the tour guides in Larabanga into the park and we gave them a safari. And we, we fed them lunch and had drinks at Zena and engaged them and then they established an understanding. So, so that was always great. For, for Magnori, um, Magnori has kept a lot of its kind of traditional values. And so they're, they've just been appreciative. Um, the community still runs in its way, but they just also, they're at the beginning of that journey. So they've only started tourism a couple years ago. So you've got to also be very mindful of, you know, their positives and negatives and of heavy volumes of tourists coming through. Absolutely. And, and like you said, engaging, um, engaging with the community is about listening and observing and understanding rather than imposing. Absolutely. Um, we, I want to be cognizant of time. We do have one question that I want to take from the uh, attendees here. Um, is there a development plan for local staff who want to move higher up into management? How, how does that work and, and how has that worked? Answer is absolutely, and I can share a quick story, but my long-term goal is that Ghanaian is 100%, uh, that Zan is 100% Ghanaian run. You know, we started with about five expats because we brought an Indian management team to help us start, then it went down to me. So we're down to one expat. Long term, um, I want it to be all Ghanaian. Uh, we actually, even before we started, John had set up a scholarship scheme around Mully National Park. So um, a great story is this gentleman named Magnus, who's now our F&B manager. Magnus was one of the first graduates of this scholarship scheme. So he focused on tourism and hospitality and was in school for that, uh, that degree while we were building Xana. So he's part of the construction team. Ghana requires national service. So after his schooling, he, he was a national service student for us and then eventually joined us. I was sitting in the, um, the reservations department and then finally worked his way up. And what was great for me, because this happened after I left by the, by the GM that I handed over to, Magnus was promoted to be the F&B manager. Um, he didn't have any F&B background, so he learned all of that at Zena. And then I've always told people from the beginning is the day that one of our staff gets hired by a high-end hotel in Accra will be a success story, not a loss for me, because we've been able to give those skills. So. Uh, we, we give as many people as possible opportunities to move up. Um, our current acting manager during COVID, because we're actually hiring a new um, professional general manager, is named Noah. Noah, he may even be on the call, so I might be embarrassing him. I think he was going to register for this. Noah started off as an accounts assistant, jumped up to the accounts lead, was the acting deputy manager, and is now the actual acting manager until we hire someone new. So absolutely, I want to see. I mean, my personal professional fulfillment comes from seeing other people achieve their potential. So it's not about lodges or travel. It's about really, for me, I'm, I'm more of a team builder and a people builder. I mean, that's, that's the part that I enjoy the most. Absolutely. Andy, we have a minute left. So I want to give the floor back to you to share any last advice or any last insights that you want to give to our attendees uh, around this whole topic. You know, I think that it took me a while um, to figure out where I wanted to land. I mean, I was a late bloomer, you should say. I think, you know, I'm, I'm 47 now, so Xana launched you know, after my 40s, so there is hope later in life if you're young. Uh, if you are younger, explore as much as possible, learn, and, and give things a shot. Um, you never know where it's going to go. I mean, Xana for me, but then you find, you also find that you become a serial entrepreneur. So Xana is the start, it's definitely not the finish. Um, and I sometimes would laugh at guys who I would say are going to be doing deals till the day they die, and I'm probably going to become one of those people. So, I mean, find out what you're passionate about. I found that when I decided after, when I went for my MBA to focus on conservation and focus on West Africa, the world became really small, but then all the relationships I developed then came into fruition. And so that, I think that's, I'll end it there. Absolutely. Sound advice from a clearly successful entrepreneur. Uh, but what we really love about this uh, concept is, is the fact that it is locally rooted and cares about the environment as much as it cares about the community. So once again, thank you, Andy, for your time. And we look forward to staying in touch with you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone. Bye.